Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, okay, so what was the initial motivation of this work is to uh, try to rethink about long-term security and to try to uh, avoid computational assumptions when it is possible. And um, so it's a quantum session, so we know that sometimes with quantum mechanics we can do things like, for example, quantum key distribution, but it's uh, sometimes for other primitives it's impossible, like information theoretically, even with uh, quantum mechanics. So uh, another idea is to uh, use relativistic cryptography, which is a fancy name to say that we have uh, two provers that uh, cannot communicate. So it was first a uh, theoretical uh, idea that kind of uh, uh, emerged, I think, in the, in, the in the 80s, and we saw like uh, multi-prover interactive proofs, and also like what we can do with two provers in terms of uh, cryptographic primitives, for example, in terms of uh, bit commitment or other such primitives. And there was a recent resurgence of, um, um, of this area, and uh, people thought, okay, like, because it was thought to be something theoretical, but, you know, can we actually uh, create physical conditions in order to uh, make sure that two provers cannot communicate, and if yes, how? And the main idea is to use uh, the relativistic constraint, or just more simply to say that if the provers are far apart, then the information has to take uh, some time to go from one prover to the other one. The, and which has a, a high speed limit of the speed of light. That information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So that was the, the main idea. And, um, and so what were recent results? So there were uh, a series of recent results in uh, uh, relativistic cryptography, uh, mostly dealing with bit commitment. So there was this fir f uh, first paper, so there was these uh, first observations that uh, if you have two provers, if you have these two provers that cannot communicate, if you want quantum mechanics, things can go uh, differently. So they had a paper from uh, two provers in isolation that said that sometimes, even information theoretically, you can have protocols that are secure in the classical setting, but not in the quantum setting, because they share an entangled state. And also, there has been constructions of uh, bit commitment schemes which are secure against quantum adversaries. And um, so uh, our initial motivation was, can we use uh, this bit commitment scheme to do other stuff? And in today's talk, uh, I'll talk about how to use bit commitment to do zero knowledge, which are things that we know how to do uh, normally, but in, when you do this reduction, sometimes you have issues. So here you have and the multi-prover setting and the quantum setting and everything. So it's not clear how all these things will compose well together. And um, uh, the main technical contribution of this talk is will actually be to analyze uh, an improved tool for analyzing the terms of quantum measurements and how uh, this, uh, these tools will be useful to uh, improve um, the analysis of uh, security against quantum adversaries. So actually, I spend a large part of my talk of talking about uh, these quantum measurement problems because like, they're more generic, so, so that we'll not um, uh, talk too much about like, uh, two prover settings. I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. And uh, somehow that uh, many people that uh, try to prove security of classical protocols against quantum adversaries can relate to. So, um, okay, so before again, like, uh, being too vague, I'll just start from one simple example and then see from there, like, what are the problems and what uh, solutions uh, uh, we bring in this paper. So, suppose uh, any kind of prover verifier scenario. So here I took, like, a Sigma protocol. You have a prover that has a... a public key, a secret key, the verifier only has the uh, public key, and the prover wants to convince the verifier that he knows the secret key without revealing it. So it's some kind of a proof of knowledge, some kind of a sigma protocol, just a message, a challenge, a first message, uh, 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 and a second message. So, um, and in many cases, the security of those protocols are based on some property called special soundness, is that if the prover can answer two different challenges, uh, let's say two, uh, then this will be a proof that he knows uh, the secret key. And, but what we do is that, okay, so of course the verifier could send, well, give, uh, we'll send to the prover two challenges and tell him answer those two challenges, but then the verifier will also be able to extract that secret key. So uh, the verifier will only uh, send one challenge and somehow this will be enough uh, to prove that the prover knows the secret key without revealing any information about the secret key. So these are something you know, uh, which are quite known, which are, uh, which are, pre which are pretty nice. And, 
so the question is, so there is this difference between one challenge and two challenge. How do you go from one challenge to two challenges? Well, normally it's very simple, so you have an algorithm that uh, answers you know, uh, one challenge, so if you ask two, then you apply the algorithm for the first challenge, and then for the second challenge, and you get the answer to both. So somehow, it's relatively easy normally to, uh, to go from one to two. And what about the quantum setting? So, okay, so we do the same thing. We get a first challenge, and we answer, and then we get a second challenge, or get them at the same time, but after the first, uh, answering this first challenge, um, what happened is that the internal quantum state has changed. So somehow, the question is, did answering the first uh, query uh, made it impossible to answer the second one? And, uh, and it may complicate answering the, the second challenge. So this is basically what most of the, of the technical part of the paper deal with and what, I, what I'll talk about here. So just to look at pictures, so if you look at quantum consecutive measurement, so this is exactly what I said. So if you have an internal state row, you have a quantum algorithm, you have a first challenge C1 and an output 1. And if you're given a second challenge, then your new internal state is row prime. And if uh, you output, and in many cases, this row prime can be very different from row. And somehow, it, these things are uh, kind of hard to control in, in general. So, OK. So um, when does the thing work well? So suppose that you have only one uh, valid uh, good outcome. So you give a challenge, and you have one good answer. And uh, you get this answer with high probability. Then uh, we know, so there is this, uh, OK, so there are several ways of calling it. One of them is called a gentle measurement lemma, is that you can perform this measurement only uh, by modifying slightly this internal state row. That somehow, if your measurement, you're almost certain that you're going to get a good answer of, of one uh, possible answer, then you're not going to change much. But in many cases, that's not what's happening. So, uh, so typically, like if you can answer the, the first challenge only with some not so high probability, or in particular, the thing is that, okay, let's say I'll always answer correctly, but it's one out of many possibilities. So let's say you know you have many good answers, and you're answering your first challenge, you'll just get one of them. So even if you always get one of the good challenges, then somehow this will have disturbed the state a lot. So you cannot really like extract one of the good answers without disturbing the state a lot. And this problem arises in many problems of soundness analysis, uh, when you look at simulation of zero knowledge, if you want to do, re I'm not even talking about rewinding, or if you got kind of uh, witness extraction. And in many cases, uh, this, 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 is a, this is a problem, and so there, uh, there was a paper by uh, Ambainis Osmanis and Unruh like from a few years ago that really said that in the most general case, this is a problem that you cannot solve, that you can find uh, algorithms and measurements so that you can easily answer one of the two challenges, any challenges, if, if you get one challenge, but it's very hard to get two of them. So in the most general case, this is, uh, th this is really a problem, and we know how to construct uh, examples where this happens. So, okay, and so uh, the final thing is can we still do something? So, okay, so if the most general case is problematic, what are the cases where we can still do something? So, just a recap we want to relate two quantities. P1 is the probability that if a quantum algorithm is given a challenge to get a, a good answer, and P12, which is the probability to output correctly on two different challenges. And so, okay, so here uh, we'll only consider for P12, for strategies that um, in, when you get the two challenges, when you do this very naive strategy that look at the first challenge, you try to answer, then you get the second challenge and you try to answer. There might be more clever ways of doing, but that will only, let's say, improve our results. So let's say that already with this very naive strategy, we have some interesting results. So. Uh, okay, so I'll, um, I'll already show what are the, the main theorems. So, first case is, as I said, single good outcome. So let's say that for any challenge, there's a unique good answer. And let's say the challenge size is n. n is the, is, is the dimension of the challenge space, so meaning that uh, log n, so uh, log n bits. 
So if the challenge is uh, of log n bits, then we can show that P12 is larger than this quantity which is uh, related to P1. So, um, and if we have as good outcomes, if we have as good solutions for each challenge, then we just uh, lose a factor of s. So, uh, okay, so th then I little bit discuss like um, quantitatively like what this means. And uh, there was actually already one, uh, one bound, like there were several bounds for like specific cases, but let's say the, I think the most generic case was like uh, from a paper by, by Unruh who was actually studying like proof of knowledge, so exactly here, that said that if P1 is larger than one over root K, okay, so K should be N here, uh, then uh, he has a bound which is similar, similar to, to the first bound, but for this P1 which is uh, not, uh, so it, it, this would be useful for P1 only larger than one over root N and not uh, one over N. And okay, so um, just to look, okay, so, how, how tight are those things? So, okay, so it's not clear how to, how to interpret those bounds. So, in the single good outcome, uh, let's, uh, let's look at this inequality. Um, these are actually pretty tight. So, first we see that if we take P1, which is large enough, then we have P12, which is larger than some cube version of P1, which was actually already the case in UNRU, that if P1 is very large, then somehow we have P12, which is larger than the cube. And we can find states and measurements, so we can find setups where uh, this cube stays somehow. So we have, no, um, uh, we have no hope in reducing this cube to uh, a square. And on the second hand, if we take P1, which is equal to 1 over n, uh, which basically, so this is kind of an extremal case. It kind of, so you can think of setups where, uh, let's say, the quantum algorithm can only answer to one challenge, to one specific challenge, that would give him a probability of one over n. So uh, this is this is why somehow we cannot we cannot go below. Um, yeah. So I mean, of course, yeah. This this holds only for uh, yeah. Otherwise, it's negative. So it's fine. So and if p1 equal one over n, then we have also some cases where this strategy will give p1 to equal zero. So it's tight in those two settings. So somehow, okay, the one over 64 is probably not tight. Uh, what happens in the cube and what happens in different behaviors, it's, it's probably not tight in several ways, but at least in these extremal points, we know that we cannot improve. So, okay, so it was a very natural question. So it, it was a very natural question, and so uh, we hope that we can use it in several things. So as I said, in uh, the, the proof of knowledge, and like this small example that I uh, showed before, uh, more generally for a bounding value of entangled games, if that's, uh, if that's your thing, and uh, the original motivation of, uh, of why, we, uh, why we started to study this was relativistic zero knowledge for NP-secure against quantum adversaries. And so, actually what happens is that once we, have this, once we had this bound, then the rest was actually pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, at least for the, for the kind of security we wanted to prove. So, not going into the, the technical details of how it works, but, uh, you know, once we have this, then the, the, uh, the rest is fine. And yeah, and then, okay, so now I'll just spend, uh, spend a few minutes talking about like this uh, multi-prover scenario so that you can see, uh, see a little bit like where we use this thing. So then we did something very simple. We had, we know a protocol for Hamiltonian cycle that, uh, uh, we know a zero knowledge protocol for Hamiltonian cycle that uses bit commitment, and we have a bit commitment scheme. So we just, so we just put them together and we see wha what happens, right? So that's a, that, that's a very natural thing. And um, yeah, so it was also, also just like a quick note is that typically uh, this would not work for like uh, for three coloring, typically. Is that like this, uh, uh, because of the reasons, because a little bit of this special soundness kind of issues is that with only two, with only two challenges, so somehow the Hamiltonian cycle will only have two challenges and you can recover, if you can answer both challenges, you can recover the whole cycle. Whereas in three coloring, if you're only, you know, you, it gives you some information if you can answer two challenges, but you cannot recover the whole coloring. So then it's not clear like what, uh, what to do. So, okay. So, okay, so here I, uh, okay, so he here I, I just uh, briefly mentioned like, uh, what are the requirements? Okay, this is all very informal now, of course. But so, uh, what are the requirements of a commitment scheme? So, 
want to commit for a bit D, and so there are two phases. After the commit phase, we want that uh, the verifier has no information about D, and that after the reveal phase, the prover cannot change his mind. So, okay. So um, what do we do? So as I said, so okay, so now it's kind of the only picture that kind of splits those two provers is that, okay, so we start from two, so we start from P1, P2. Okay, they're very, they're, they're very, very far away. Okay, they don't have to be very far away, but let's say, you know, like a, a few hundred thousand kilometers. And let's say that beforehand, you know, they managed to, uh, they, so they, they, they have a secret, they, they have a secret A, they have a secret string A, and we'll always be working in some uh, finite field of uh, dimension Q. So all of these strings will be of size uh, log Q. And then, again, the verifier, so if the two provers are far away and we want like, to have very like, sharp synchronization, we cannot have one verifier that talks to the two of them and somehow like, uh, have something meaningful, right? Otherwise, we would give more power to the verifier. So we'll also split the verifiers into two and do the following. So the first message, the verifier will send a random string B in FQ to the prover, and he will send back Y equals A, the secret, plus B times D, B being uh, the query and D being the, uh, the bit. So D is, in, D is in 0, 1 here, but you know, it just, it's the, the same multiplication. And the prover 2 will just send A and D. And then the two verifiers, they will check this thing, but then you know, after, after this prover sends this message, then let's say the protocol is over and they can check offline somehow. You can, a lot of time can pass and you, know, you can check that uh, uh, everything is valid somehow, that uh, the, the Y and the AD, everything corresponds. So, and the only thing that we require from this scheme is that uh, we require P2 to send this message uh, before he has any information about B, before any information about B can travel to the second prover. So, you know, if, uh, if you're a hundred, uh, you know, if you're 300 kilometers away, it takes a millisecond. You know? So it's not, uh, you know, which is not that, which is not that short, you know, it's, it's uh, in, in, in 2017, right? Unlike in uh, 19, uh, 1980. So, and, okay, so this was, so uh, this is, was, okay, so what I've got, the FQ, the FQ scheme, which was like proposed by Lungi et al. And so they did uh, an analysis and, you know, so somehow they reduced this, uh, uh, this protocol to an entangled game. And we know that, uh, that, 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 the protocol, that the protocol is secure. And the arguments are, in the end, the arguments are a little bit similar than this special, this uh, consecutive measurement is that if the P2 can answer both can, answer, uh, can uh, give two openings, one for d equal zero and one for d equal one, that will satisfy those two checking properties, then you can easily extract b, which, and b should be hidden from p2. So this is the, this is the main thing. Okay, this, uh, okay, so this is the textbook, this is a textbook Hamiltonian cycle, zero knowledge protocol for Hamiltonian cycle with commitments. Okay, so I don't have a lot of time, so I will not uh, uh, go too deep into this, into this protocol. You can read it. The only thing I want to say is that um, we said, first of all, as I said before, if you, have, if you can answer the two challenges, then somehow you'll be able to recreate the Hamiltonian cycle. But there's actually also a problem in this, uh, in this protocol is that, uh, there are many possible answers, is that somehow there is this hidden permutation pi uh, in the protocol, and for each pi, there is a valid opening somehow. So you have uh, V, let's say if now uh, M is the number of vertices, you have M factorial possible, uh, po po possible answers. So, and we said that you, know, you, lose a f you lose a factor of one by M, factor by M factorial somewhere, and somehow, it will still work out. So somehow we will just work on these very low probabilities, and uh, we'll see how it works. So, okay. So again, all, all of this is very informal, but just you know, just trying to show you how all these kind of uh, quantities go together. As I said, is that okay? If there's no Hamiltonian cycle, somehow you'll have to break the commitment scheme, and breaking the commitment scheme, as I said before, it will happen with probably one over q, and. So somehow this P12, somehow breaking the commitment schemes, what I say, meaning being able to 
have uh, produced the two openings. So this P1 tool will be 1 over Q, and if you want P1 to be smaller than epsilon, we need to take Q, if we know, if you just plug this in the other formula, we need to take Q, which is this huge thing. It's a huge thing, but it's the dimension of the thing, so actually the communication is log of this. So log of this is actually fine, so uh, as long as the messages you sent are polynomial in the number of vertices and in uh, 1 over epsilon, then we can, uh, uh, we, we can show the security of this protocol. So, okay, I'm running late, so I'm just gonna, you know, this, uh, this is just a quick recap, so we saw this generic bound for consecutive measurements, uh, and we prove zero knowledge, and okay, so uh, what are the open questions now? So here the security we prove is very basic, so again, so we had a bit commitment scheme that we don't know how to compose, we wanted to use it for zero knowledge, so we had to redo the whole thing from scratch somehow. And again, now we have a zero knowledge scheme, and again, if we want to use it for something else, we'll have to redo the, the whole thing from scratch, right? Another thing which is kind of uh, a bit surprising is because we work on these low probabilities, this isn't even a proof of knowledge. So if you can, so if you can win this game, we cannot show that you can produce uh, the cycle, actually, because, be, because of this uh, factorial, because of this uh, m factorial thing, you can only show that you can create this Hamiltonian cycle of probably one over m factorial, which is not... Uh, uh, which is not great. And also, like, other primitives, so also you say, oh, well, okay, so these things work well, so you can use this bit commitment, you know, you kind of, uh, you, can you do it for something else? Typically, oblivious transfer, you say, okay, in the quantum setting, you have uh, a reduction from bit commitment to oblivious transfer, so you say, great, let's use it as well. And actually, here this is a case where things don't work out very well, somehow. Uh, because you have this bit commitment scheme that only works for a certain amount of time, and then oblivious transfer, uh, you need some very kind of static security for, for both players. Somehow you can break those schemes. And of course, like, uh, uh, you know, what are other applications of the bound? And you know, Alan here, thank you. <laughs>